Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm just going to present the work we've done on identifying some novel mutants uh, with auto seminal root number. Uh, to start with, um, I just want to highlight the fact that the world is undergoing uh, severe water stress, uh, mainly caused by competing use of water for agriculture, human consumption, and industrial purposes. And it means that at a time when we need to double food production the most because of the increasing world population, we have less water for agriculture. And one of the crops that is most likely to be affected by this water stress is wheat. So this is uh, the wheat plant. Uh, and you might not know, wheat has the widest range of cultivation of all the crops cultivated in the world. So it's cultivated all the way from Scandinavia even down to Argentina. And importantly also, it's the crop that supplies 20% of global calorie and protein intake. So wheat is very important. But much like this picture, we don't really know much about the roots of wheat. We only know mo mostly about the shoot. And we don't really know much about the root. And uh, up until now, only one gene controlling root architecture in wheat has been identified. That is Van Wan uh, in Lee Iki's lab. And I believe he has a poster, a poster number 49 on that. So you can find out more information on that. And some of the reason for this is mainly because of the genome complexity of wheat and also the difficulty in phenotyping root. Now, I'm a, I'm a geneticist, so I would like to talk more about the genome complexity of wheat so you understand where we're coming from. So the modern bred wheat genome uh, is actually a polyploid. And so it started off with hybridization event of two diploid wheat species, uh, Triticum muratu and uh, Agilov spiritodis. And then that gave rise to the tetraploid wheat. So each genome supplied the A and the B genome into the tetraploid wheat. And this further hybridized with another diploid species uh, to give rise to the modern exaploid bread wheat. So this polyploidization event has an impact on the size of the wheat genome. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to show you compare the wheat genome to other uh, sequence genome that you are familiar with. So let's start with the famous Arabidopsis. So Arabidopsis has uh, a fairly sizable 135 megabase per genome. And that is tripled by rice with about 450 megabase per genome. And uh, in you and I have about 3 gigabase per genome. But the genome size of wheat is quite massive. It's about 15 gigabase per. And you wonder why on earth do people work on this crop? Um, but to add to the complexity, there's a lot of genetic redundancy with wheat. So when you look at every single gene in wheat, there are three copies of, of each gene. So for every single gene in wheat, there are three copies of each gene. Uh, so it means that there's a lot of genetic redundancy, and you might not be able to study each gene in isolation. But there is an advantage here, because the genetic redundancy of wheat allows us to uh, do more genetic study in the sense that wheat is able to accumulate more mutation. Now, if you compare it to uh, diploid uh, crops like rice, for you to be able to knock out 90% of a gene in rice, 90% of all the genes in rice, you need to develop about 10,000 mutants, EMS mutants, develop 10,000 and screen them to knock out 90% of the gene in rice. But in wheat, you only need to develop about 1,200 to 1,500 mutants, and then you're fairly confident that you've knocked out 90% of the gene in rice, not in one plant, but in, in different plants. And that is exactly what we have done in the lab in collaboration with many other labs. So we've developed a, a wheat mutant population, an EMS wheat mutant population, uh, through the standard protocol. But interestingly, we've gone further to be able to identify the mutation in this population by sequencing the genome of each mutant plant. Remember I told you the genome of wheat is quite complex. So we took advantage of the fact that just 2% of the wheat genome comprise of the coding sequence. So if we are to find some functional mutation, which are likely to be in the coding sequence, we should concentrate on the coding sequence. And so we used a, uh, an approach called exome capture to just capture the coding sequence of the wheat genome and sequence these to identify the mutation. Now, from this protocol, about 1,200 exoploid mutant lines were developed and sequenced in the background of a, a UK wheat variety called Cadenza, which I will come back to later and about 6.4 million mutations identified, uh, meaning about 5,000, uh, approximately 5,000 mutations 
uh, identified by mutant line, but these are just in the coding region. Now we have lots of mutants, but how do we phenotype them? So we need to go into the phenotyping bottleneck now. Now to do that, I, I want to introduce you to the architecture, the, the root architecture of wheat. So typically wheat comprises of the embryonic seminal root uh, and the post-embryonic nodal root as has, has been introduced. Um, the, the embryonic seminal roots are, are mainly this ones here, and it's comprised mainly of the primary roots, primary seminal root, and there are two pairs of seminal root, uh, SR1 and SR, SR2, uh, the SR2 and SR3, sorry, are the first pair, and SR4 and SR5 are the second pair of seminal root. So seminal root develop immediately uh, after germination. And not only that, they, are also, they can also develop uh, much longer. Um, uh, yeah, this is a six weeks old uh, wheat plant using X-ray uh, uh, CT, and you can see seminal roots here. But later on, even at flowering, the longer roots there are the seminal roots, while the roots here are the nodal roots. So the seminal roots can develop even deeper. So this picture was kindly provided by Malcolm Bennett. So seminal roots are important. So we decided to focus on, on seminal roots. Uh, decided to focus on seminal roots. Now to do this, we, we had to phenotype quite a number of plants, and we, we were looking for inspiration on how to do this, and we found an unlikely inspiration uh, from the Christmas tree. I know it's not Christmas, but, uh, but by using the Christmas tree storage box, we found that the boxes were long enough to contain quite a lot of plants. And so we went out in the middle of June to buy quite a lot of uh, Christmas tree storage boxes. And, uh, and we modified this uh, with a little bit of engineering, very low cost, we modified this into root phenotyping units where the plants were grown in pouches and then they can be fired up like in a cabinet and root. Now with this protocol, we're able to phenotype about 1,800, uh, 1,800 seedlings in about two weeks, which gives us enough throughput to be able to do the work that we, we've, we've done. So we recently published this work in BioArchive uh, with, that, with a link over there so you can find out more about the work. Now that we have the platform, uh, so we, I phenotyped about 660 uh, cadenza mutant lines. I did uh, aim for about 10 replications per line using a randomized complete block design. Now, so this is the workflow I went through. I will not spend too much time on them. I selected single spike, seeds from single spikes to reduce the heterogeneity of each line, and then did some seed size stratification to reduce the effect of seed size, uh, perform code stratification so that they have uniform germination, and then did the phenotyping and the image analysis with a software called RootNav and some statistical analysis. Now going into the result, so just like I told you before, cadenza mainly has five number of roots, of seminal roots, and most of the cadenza control we use did show that phenotype. But we, we also looked at the, the mutant, and most of the mutant, I'm sorry you cannot see it very well because of the screen resolution, but most of the mutant also cluster around cadenza. They show non-significantly different root number to cadenza. But we also identified mutants yeah, that have higher number of root number and significantly lower number of root number here. Yeah. Now you can see that there are some overlaps, so we knew that there could be some false positive in this case. But in total, we identified about 52 mutants. Interestingly, we also found the effect of seed size on root number. So if you look at this violin plot, the large seed size tend to have more root number than the small and the medium sized seeds. But we believe that there is a stronger genetic influence in the control of seminal root number because the dots here are the cadenza control and the differently sized cadenza show about the same amount of, of seminal root number. But interestingly, uh, the size has a stronger effect on the root length. So when you, have, when you measure the root length, the size seems to play a most important role on the root length paths because the larger seed size have more root reserve and they are able to elongate faster. Now, so we thought, okay, we're going to validate these phenotypes in an independent screen. So we worked with uh, uh, collaborators uh, from uh, the University of Leeds, Dr. Stefan Kepinski and, and his PhD student, Ryan Kai. They used a similar platform as well and the phenotype is a subset of the line that we phenotyped. 
And the correlation between the two phenotypes is, is quite good and encouraging. So we found good correlation between the phenotype we got from the primary screen and the phenotype they got from the secondary screen. And interestingly, the mutants that we found to be higher or lower root number show up, showed up in both screens. So this further confirmed the phenotype of this mutant. So we, we chose the mutants that show good phenotype in both screens for further characterization. So we t selected those lines and, uh, and selected three additional spikes th from three different plants uh, uh, and, and phenotyped those, mainly to see if these phenotypes are consistent and if we can recover this phenotype. Uh, and this is for cadenza. This is the heat map here. Five here is this color. And you can see cadenza mostly have five number of roots. Uh, but we identified a mutant line with altered number of roots, which we call unmutant, and this is un1. And you can see it mostly has six number of seminal roots compared to cadenza. Uh, the other mutants we identified have lower number of seminal roots, and they are called un2, 2, two and 8. Uh, but one thing you will notice here that they have varying degree of penetrance, but most of them show stable phenotypes across the different spikes. Now, we went further to characterize what is the timing of this effect. So we, we want to know which of the root type is affected and when do you actually start seeing this effect. So this is cadenza here, and day one after germination, it has one primary root. And at day three, it has the first pair of seminal roots. Day five, you can see the second pair of seminal roots. Uh, in an one, it seems that the rate of root development is faster in an one because at day three after germination, you can already see the first and the second pair of seminal root. And at day seven, you can see the sixth seminal root. In the rest of the unmutant, some of them, uh, they have the same rate of germination of development with cadenza, but they don't seem to develop the, the second pair of seminal roots. As you can see at day five, they, they seem to just stay at that first pair of seminal roots. Now, even among these lower root number mutants, we found some differences. For example, uh, and, and four and, and eight here. You can see and four seems to develop a very rud rudimentary uh, seminal root, second pair of seminal roots here. But this is absent in an eight. Uh, finally, we went on to look at what is the genetic control of these unphenotypes. And basically, we looked at the M6 and the F1 population. Uh, this is for an one year, and you can see cadenza is having five number of seminal roots according to this color scale. And the M6, we are still able to recover the phenotype, showing that it's stable across generation. But in the F1, we couldn't recover the phenotype, suggesting that it might actually be a recessive mutation. In most of the lower root number of mutants that we, we identified, most of them behaved in a dominant manner because most of the F1 has the, have the same phenotype as the, as the parent, uh, except for a few that are not very stable, like uh, and 2 for example. Uh, for an one and an two, we, we sorry and three for example. For an one and an two, we went further to look at the F2 to see how many genes are controlling the trait, and uh, we we see that in an one, for example, it it appears that it is a multigenic trait because it doesn't agree with a three to one segregation pattern, but in an two, it agrees with a three to one segregation pattern, suggesting that it's controlled by a single dominant gene. Uh, we already know some of the genes that control root development in maize, and I, I believe Frank Weiss at the back here uh, wrote an excellent review about some of the genes controlling root development in maize. Uh, but in a particular interest, uh, RTC S and uh, ROM1 and Big1 that have seminal root phenotypes. So we check for the presence of mutation in this gene in some of these mutants. Uh, now, to do that, we have a wheat tilling population, which I want to introduce you to if you're interested in wheat. Just like Arabidopsis, you can go to this website and enter the gene model of your gene of interest and identify mutants in the gene. Now, for, an, for RTC1, we found the wheat homologue of RTC1. And interestingly, we found a, 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 a mutation that causes a premature stop codon uh, in, in this gene. And that is present in HAN8. So it mainly shows that an 8 contains a mutation in RTC1, although this is just an M5 phenotype that we need to confirm further genetically, but this is a promising leak. Now to summarize, uh, the exome sequence with population are very useful for reverse and forward genetics of root architecture, and we've identified some mutants that will be very useful 
uh, uh, for studying root development, and they showed distinct number, distinct type of uh, genetic control and segregation. And RTC is likely to be a candidate gene for wheat. Now, just before I finish, I just want to introduce, acknowledge my, my lab members, and also acknowledge uh, Stefan Kepinski and, and Ryan Kaye. And also, I want to introduce, for those who are new to wheat, if you, we are really interested for people to come and work with wheat, uh, neglecting the genome size. And these are some of the websites that have been useful. You can look at the expression pattern of any gene of interest. And interestingly, we also have a wheat training website if you want to learn more about how to work on wheat. Thank you very much.